G'day guys and gal. If you've been watching some of my lore videos on the Trader Legions, then you would probably know by now that I have a raging hard on for Space Marines who, despite being a part of a Trader Legion, remain loyalist. They are some of the most interesting, compelling and impactful Astartes in the entire setting. It doesn't take strength or willpower to stay loyal to the Emperor if your Primarch is, but if your Primarch isn't, defying them and doing what is right is one of the hardest decisions that can be made. Coming back to that age old debate of what is more important, loyalty or doing what is right. By the end of this video, it's my hope that you'll see that Space Marines from Trader Legions are not skewed or doomed towards chaos, and that any Primarch who fell or stayed loyal would have a similar result. After all, most of the Marines who founded the Grey Knights were from Trader Legions, Grey Knights being the Space Marines who can't fall to chaos. Before we get started, I'm really excited to announce the launch of the Major Kill 100k merch which comes in a hoodie and two singlets to cover you hot and cold dudes and dudettes out there. There are only 100 hoodies available and the design is gnarly. Gold electric vinyl in the silhouette of two Warhammers. You can choose to get g'day fuckheads on the sleeves or just leave them blank. I obviously chose them for mine because they're awesome. Each hoodie is unique and has their own corresponding number on the sleeve. And yes, number 69 has already been pre-ordered by someone else so put your dick away. The singlets are in the muscle style shirt, not the wife beater style, I'm not that much of a neckbeard, which means you'll look killer wearing it on the beach, in the gym, or just at home. Design might seem simple, but here's the kicker. The major kill text on the singlet is made up of hundreds of tiny words which say, G'day, fuckheads, over and over, inspired by Conor McGregor's pinstripe suit. Singlet comes in both black and white, and they won't run out of stock. The singlets are not yet available as we're still figuring out a fair pricing for them, but feel free to message me on Discord for one, and as soon as they're available, I'll let you know. As I said, there are 100 hoodies, however, I think it will take a couple weeks to sell out, so if you're watching this video and you're keen for one, make sure you check because they're probably still going to be there. All prices are in Australian, which means everything is cheap as shit. If you want to see the merchant action before you buy, I'll be wearing it for this Sunday evening stream where I'll be playing Dawn of War Ultimate Apocalypse with Great Book of Grudges. Lord Cylon, who's the lead dev of the mod, so if you want to ask him any questions or have a chat to him, perfect time to do so, and hopefully Baldemort if his back is feeling better. Today we'll go over each of the main loyalists from Trade Allegiance and what happened to them. At the end we'll then discuss the use of Trader Gene Seed within the Imperium in the current 40k setting, and how it has helped or hindered them. Let's get into it. When Horus lost all his hair and declared Jihad upon the Emperor as a result of this, all the Trade Allegiance purged themselves of their loyalist counterparts. Dozens of thousands of marines who would have potentially rejected their Primarch's betrayal of their granddaddy were systematically killed. The most notable of these purges was on Istvan III, the dropside atrocity. The Trader Legion spent quite a while interviewing and assessing their legion to figure out exactly where the loyalties of each of their sons lay. They came to the conclusion that roughly one third of each of their legions would need to be purged. Now that doesn't mean one third were loyalist or would refuse chaos, they were just not completely blinded by their loyalty. After all, if they didn't account for every single loyalist before they unleashed their trap, then any loyalist they miss would ruin their plans and make the purging way harder than it needed to be. Which is exactly what happened. The first red flag was the fact that all the Space Marine squads got rearranged and jumbled around for no apparent reason. The real reason obviously being separating the loyalists from the traitors. On top of this, various dickheads such as the flamboyant fuckwit Ildin of the Emperor's children chose not to join the final assault on the planet. This drew the attention of the Loyalist officer, Saul Tavitz, who was so shocked by Ildin not wanting to go down and flex on the enemy that he immediately became suspicious. Saul was a great warrior and commander, but never had the ambition that other Empress children had. He was content with his role and was proud to serve the Emperor and the Imperium as a whole. He embodied the purity of purpose that the Empress children should have been, and he rejected the arrogance that they had instead chose to embrace. Due to his suspicions, Saul asked that the legendary dreadnought Rylanor to take his place in the assault so he could stay on his ship and investigate what was really going on. Rylanor agreed to meet his fate as Saul discovered that the planet was to be virus bombed from orbit at the climax of the battle, below, wiping out all the loyalists on it. Now Saul could have taken a ship and fled. He could have boarded his honor brother's ship and left with him, but he chose to do the honorable thing. He quickly boarded a Thunderhawk and beelined straight down to the planet in order to warn his brothers down there. On his way down, he was chased by traitor ships who were obviously not super down with their plans ruined by a snitch. 
They were passing by Nathaniel Garo's ship. Garo was a captain of the Death Guard and born on Terra, serving with honor and nobility for the entirety of the Great Crusade. He actively fought to keep the traditions of the original Death Guard, once called the Dusk Raiders, alive, as he saw nobility in that opposed to whatever Morty and his smelly sons from Barbaros were doing. Despite being quite opposed to the direction of the Legion, Mortarion held Garo in such high esteem that even when Garo made it clear that he was first and foremost loyal to the Emperor, Mortarion chose to keep Garo alive and try to convince him of the traitor's cause. This was to be a rookie error by Mortarion, as any reasonable person would reject the notion of getting destroyed by Nurgle's smelly Russian starfish. Now that I think of it, the heresy only came to be because the vast majority of space marines are incredibly unreasonable. During the invasion of Istvan, some Slaneshi bitch read at Garo really hard, crushing his ribs and blowing his leg off. This obviously made Garo pretty unfit for the rest of the campaign, hence he was relegated to one of the orbital ships, the same ship that Saul flew past in his mad dash to get to the planet's surface. As Saul flew past, Garo was told over Vox by Ilden, Yo, Garo, Saul is a little snitch, so I'ma need you to blow him up. And then Saul Vox Garo being like, Don't listen to that little bitch lasagna. If you blow me up, you're gay. And Garo, being the devout homophobe he was, decided to instead blow up the ships chasing Saul and allow him to land on the planet. In truth, Saul and Garo were honor brothers as I mentioned, so if anyone else was flying past, Garo would have destroyed them. But like, Saul and Garo had carved their gauntlets so that when they do the hand clasp, it would form the Imperial Quilla. Bro. Bro. Garo's crew were like a WTF man, but Garo was able to convince them that Saul was telling the truth and to not report that he had just blown up space marines in violation of his commanding officer's orders. Saul arrived on the planet and told everyone about the oncoming global virus bombing that would be followed up by more bombs, hence two thirds of the loyalists were able to get to bunkers and other cover before the bombs fell. If Saul had not done this, it's likely only a small handful would have survived if that. When the firestorm had cleared and the Vox channels were unblocked, Horus was pissed off to find the channels were full of voices of thousands of loyalist Astartes calling him a bold piece of shit who can suck a camel cock. Angron was super mad that some of the loyalists survived, which is no surprise here, Angron is super mad about everything. Hence he led a spontaneous assault on the loyalist world eaters that survived. Erlen was the commander of the Loyalist World Eaters, a decorated war hero who had been disfigured in previous battles. In a rage against the betrayal, he counterattacked his former brethren, but was cut down and killed. Garviel Loken was the Loyalist captain of the Lunar Wolves and was fighting on Isfan when it was bombed. He had received Saul's warning and hid when the bombs dropped. Loken was known for his unshakable courage and honor, two things that were common within Loyalists from Traitor Legions. Loken was brought into Horus's inner circle, his Mournival, to play Devil's Advocate. He was tasked with picking apart and countering any of Horus's plans that he had an issue with. Now pre-Bold Horus was wise and enjoyed other people's thoughts and opinions. Post-Bold Horus was an arrogant douche he did not. Hence Loken was outcasted by the rest of the Mournival, other than Tarek, who's a legend, who sucked Horus's cock, and by Horus himself. Likely because Loken was the only one in the Mournival with a full head of hair. Loken used his knowledge as a captain to help Saul prepare a legendary defense against the traitors sent to wipe out the surviving loyalists, and boy did the traitors pay. For nearly three months, the traitors were held back, bled, and delayed. Guerrilla warfare, ambushes, and daring counterattacks meant that cocky leaders like Ilden just couldn't get the job done. Another lunar wolf who helped Loken was the gigantic friendly giant Tarek Torgadon, who was also part of the Mournival. Tarek happily joined the heretical warrior lodges, which were how Chaos was able to spread throughout the legions, as he naively saw them as a way to make more friends. However, once Horus went bold and the warrior lodges went from playing Monopoly to discussing rebellion against the Emperor, he became disillusioned with them and became suspicious of Horus and the other lunar wolves, such as Abaddon and Little Horus. The final member of this loyalist dream team was Rylanor, the Ancient One, a dreadnought who just wouldn't die, and who was able to shrug off mortal wounds using just hatred alone. However, despite delaying the traitors for months and causing thousands of deaths, the loyalists were outnumbered, without orbital support, with depleted supplies, and with no Primarchs. Inevitably, they would fall. But not without a fight. The final assault began as the traitors bum-rushed the loyalists, using a titan to blow away resistance. Lucius, that demented piece of shit, betrayed the Loyalists and challenged Saul to a duel, believing himself to be greater than Saul. 
Lucius was quickly proven wrong as he got his ass kicked and was sent running. Saul then ambushed Eildon's troops and killed many of them. He was genuinely undefeatable and survived until Horus once again orbitally bombed the planet to oblivion. Before that happened, Loken and Tarek heard that Abaddon and Little Horus were taking a part in the final assault and thought that they could take them out with them. Tarek fought Little Horus as Loken fought Abaddon, and despite their prowess, Tarek was killed by Little Horus, while Loken was wounded by Abaddon and watched as the planet was orbitally bombed. Rylanor was able to escape to a hidden bunker and found something in that bunker that he planned to use hundreds of years later. After the Istvan atrocity, it seems that Saul died, and Tarek definitely died. However, Loken, despite being mentally broken, survived, as did Rylanor. Now back to Garo. Garo beelined to escape after killing the traitors on his ship, and it was a pretty rough time for him. His ship was fired on, and then he had to make a random warp jump with a weakened Gellerfield, forcing Garo to fight Nurgle zombies on his ship in the warp before he was finally rescued by Rogel Dawn. The escape had been a success, and the Pyrim was aware of Horus' betrayal. Garo was approached by Malkador after he banished the demon of Nurgle called the Lord of Flies, who had followed Garo to Terra. Malkador said he was to go out into the galaxy and find seven space marines from any legion with noble hearts and the will to fight chaos. He was then to bring them back here. He was now a Knight of Malkador. His quest took him to Ultramar, where he recruited the powerful Ultramarine Liberian Rubio after he saved him and his company of marines. He then encountered the World Eater Captain Mesa Varen, who was especially angry, even by World Eater standards, due to the betrayal of Angron. And boy, it showed. Even after escaping Angron and Istvan, Mesa was once again betrayed by a White Scars captain who tried to kill Garo and his knights. In response, Mesa ravaged most of the White Scars men before teleporting Garo and co back to their ship where they then blew up the White Scar captain and his traitors. Mesa was now a knight of Malkador. Garo recruited a number of other knights before eventually returning to Istvan to try find Loken. I mean, I'm glad he did that, but it seems like a massive stretch to think that Loken out of all people somehow survived a duel with Abaddon and then multiple orbital bombings. This however would turn out to be a good move, as Garo would land, find Loken, help him break out of his insanity amnesia before taking him back to Terra. Now before we continue with the Knights of Malkador, there's a bit more info of Tarek and Rylanor. Tarek's corpse was harvested and used to summon a demon, Raf. This act, however, restored some of Tarek's consciousness in the form of a spirit who motivated and inspired Loken when Loken was feeling down about his daddy being a massive asshole. Rylanor stayed on Isvan where he patiently bided his time. After a few hundred, or maybe thousands of years, he let out a distress beacon, not for safety, but to lure Fulgrim to Isvan so he could kill him. Fulgrim travelled there with a group of thousand sons, and together they found an extremely pissed off Rylanor. Now this moment in lore is already incredible, however Stringstorm recently did a song retelling the moment and it makes it even more awesome. I'll play a clip from it and then link it in the descriptions below so you can check it out after this video. At last Fulgrim you have come to me, abomination. Words uttered by a shattered pile of metal rust and stagnation. You've had millennia to think of what to tell me of my attention. I need not glory enough for words to speak when I have held a virus bomb. So basically, Rylanor tries to detonate a virus bomb he found in his little bunker in order to kill Fulgrim. However, the Thousand Sons with Fulgrim are basically able to put a time bubble around the bomb and prevent it from detonating. Fulgrim then taunts the defiant Rylanor and talks of how he will corrupt him. The Thousand Sons are so disgusted with Fulgrim and so impressed by Rylanor that they allow the bomb to detonate, killing themselves, Rylanor, and banishing Fulgrim back to the warp for many years. Back to Stringsom's more impressive way of retelling it, this time the Thousand Sons the one talking. Inspired by the things I've heard, I raise my voice and shout clearly and out of turn. I know this sounds better than you, or Primark. Rylanor deserves better than all of us. Eat a massive dick, Fulgrim. Garo and Loken would travel the galaxy, fighting against the traitors and once again coming face to face with Horus, with Loken delivering a sick burn when they escaped him. Eventually they would return to Terra, and the Lord of Flies would once again return, possessing Mesa who was able to resist the demonic influence long enough for him to kill himself and the demon. The Emperor told them, to their surprise, that they would not fight in the upcoming war and siege of Terra, but in the wars to come. 
they were to become the Order of the Grey Knights. That's right, the Grey Knights, Space Marine with the Emperor's own Gene Seed, were mostly made up of Space Marines from Traitor Legions. This was not to be Loken's destiny. He refused the Emperor's offer as his fate was tied to that of the Sons of Horus. He vowed he would kill Abaddon and Little Horus. Garo, despite accepting the role of Grey Knight, would stand by Loken and help him finish his quest. We currently don't know how that pans out, as not all the Horus Heresy novels are out yet. However, we do know that Loken and Garo deliver so much death of the traitors that would make even Sigismund blush. Loken gets his revenge on Little Horus and kills him, whilst Garo beats the shit out of Abaddon, with Abaddon only surviving because he gets teleported to safety at the last second. Something that Abaddon has done a number of times now, the fucking pussy. Isfahan was not the only place where loyalists from Traitor Legions were found. An important space marine with the unpronounceable name of Ruviel Arvidia would play a key role. Arvi, as I will now call him, was a loyalist Thousand Sun who was not on Prospero when Lehman spurged out and destroyed it. He arrived there later in confusion and he assisted some White Scar Marines to help find Jagadai and in return they would take him with them. Without Arvi, the White Scars would be pretty screwed, hence once he helped them they offered him a role in their legion, which while tempted to accept, Arvi was a proud son of Magnus and a proud servant of the Emperor. Unfortunately for Arvi, he began to experience the flesh change, a devastating mutation for the Thousand Sons which slowly turned them into chaos. Rough. Arvi was taken to Terra where Malkador bound him with a noble shard of Magnus, creating a demi-primarch called Janus. Janus was then appointed as the Supreme Grandmaster of the Grey Knights and tasked with building the Order. We don't know what ended up happening to Janus, however due to how powerful he was, only the most hectic of enemies would be able to bring him down, if he is even down that is. So now we know the key loyalists who more or less saved the Imperium, is there still use of traded gene seed in loyalists today? The answer is yes, the Minotaur chapter, a steadfast and incredibly loyal group of marines, a descent from iron warriors. The Blood Ravens, heroes of the Imperium and the Dawn of War games, seem to be Thousand Sun descendants. There are numerous other chapters with questionable gene seed that are incredibly loyal, which means that Gilliman's request to call not to use traded gene seed for the Primaris is unfounded. If G-Man turned against the Emperor, it's likely at least two thirds of his legion would follow, as Space Marines are hard coded to be loyal to their Primarchs. Sure, Gene Seed often makes Space Marines become similar to their Primarch. For the Lunar Wolves, it made many of them look like Horus, whilst the Salamander Marines all became black after receiving the Gene Seed. However, it only can do so much. It doesn't turn them into a new person. I've said it many times, and I'll say it again. Loyalists with Gene Seed are awesome. And that does us for today guys, the loyalists from Trader Legions and the impact they have had on the setting. Remember guys, merch is now live, so make sure you go in and pick up your hoodie or message me on Discord to save a singlet. If you enjoyed the video, like tits and want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Only $1 gives you access to a boatload of Warhammer Hentai, and $10 gives you access to the Magical Hentai calendar. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more loyalist content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.